I'd like to welcome everyone to the 2023 Digital Skills Summit and thank you all for taking time out of your busy schedules today. I've never seen quite so much activity in Brussels all at the same time, much of it from what I can tell right here in the Residence Palace, which is an absolute beehive this morning. So thank you for being with us and thank you for running the gauntlet and finding us back here in the corner on the far side of the European Health Summit, which um, seems very healthy. Um, if you don't know me, my name is Paul Hoffheins, and I'm the president and co-founder of the Lisbon Council, and I have the honor and privilege of serving as the host and moderator here this morning. Look, we all know the European Union has ambitious goals in the skills and education field. 80% of the population is supposed to have basic digital skills by 2030, and 20 million trained information and communication technology specialists. That's a lot of people, 80% of 750 million. Of course, this, these goals are in what we see in the famous digital compass, but how are we going to get there and where are we now? We have an amazing program assembled for you here this morning. Oh, hi, Giorgio. Hi. I didn't realize you weren't, weren't in your seat. Do you want me to start over? I'll, I'll brief you later on what you missed. <laughs> we have a very good program for you here this morning around these questions. And the summit, I hope, will be interesting from the point of view, of course, of substance and new ideas, the currencies of think tanks like ours but also interesting from the point of view of relevance and connection with the real world. The place where any skills initiative, if it's to be successful, will need to deliver and take hold. The European Commission, as I think most of you know, has done some pioneering work in that respect. For two years, while many of us were doing other things, they led a painstaking structured dialogue with European Union member states, looking to better understand where consensus might lie and further progress might be made. The result are the two flagship initiatives we will hear about this morning, named in fancy Brussels speak, the proposal for a council regulation on the enabling factors for a successful digital education. Don't let that fool you. Behind that boring title is a very important initiative. There's a second one too, the proposal for a council recommendation for improving the provision of digital skills in education and training. Both of them somewhat bizarrely called proposals for council recommendations, which should tell you about the care and gingerness with which the issues are being approached at the member state level. Look, we're delighted that one of, we're delighted that one of the protagonists behind this project is here this morning, Mr. Georgi Dimitrov, who's the head of unit for digital education at the Education, Youth, Sports, and Culture Division of the European Commission. Uh, he's gonna take us deep into the boiler room on that. And, and Georgi, I hope as well, address the crucial question that we talked about over coffee just now. Uh, which is how can we help? And I'm not asking that to be, to be polite. I think success will come from the work, involvement, and engagement of communities like ours. So please, activate us. We're at your service. Um, uh, it, we also have some other special guests who've come a long way to be with us this morning. And first and foremost, I'm referring to uh, uh, Giorgio Ventre, the professor of computer networks at University of Naples, Federico II. By the way, I would never be accepted in a course like that, but I might be accepted in the other place where you also teach. He's the scientific director of the Apple Developer Academy in Naples. The Academy, of course, as we know, is a joint initiative of Naples Federico II and Apple. And for those of you who don't know this amazing project, it's located in San Giovanni a Teduccio. Did I pronounce that correctly? Perfect. Thank you. And it does, maybe I could get in your class. Um, an industrial neighborhood that once produced the first railway cars in Italy. Of course, that was back in 1842, and today the area is better known as a center of urban problems of the type that plagued nearby Naples, and the scene of a very important regeneration project about which we will hear more in a few minutes. Uh, the Academy was founded in 2016, and since then it's offered coding courses and business level mentorship to more than 5,000 students. Many have gone on to start companies or lead other skills-driven projects, including important ones regarding skills diffusion in places like Africa and elsewhere. Professor Vontra is going to take us deep into the workings of the Academy, and you'll seek to answer two burning questions. How do we take initiatives like this to scale, beyond Naples and out into the world and other similar communities? And when do we, and when we do, how do we make sure the teaching we offer reaches the communities we would like to reach? Those aren't easy questions, as many of you know from OECD work in this area, some of which was presented here recently at a similar seminar. Uh, we're delighted Professor Vonter can be with us, and I have to say truly delighted, and we're looking forward to hearing all you have to say about this amazing adventure. Um, also joining is Eva Maydell, known to all of you here for her leadership in the complex field of education 
and on so many digital regulation dossiers that I can't keep track. Um, I don't know how you do it, Eva. You have a very good team. You need it. Eva is also a bit less known in this town, the co-founder of Education Bulgaria 2030, which is an NGO based in the country she knows best. She's been a mainstay at Lisbon Council Skills Initiatives over the years, and we appreciate that more than you can know, blessing us often with her presence, her unique wisdom, her passion, and her razor-sharp insights into the spirit of our times. Eva, we're delighted to have you here with us again, and let me take this moment to thank you for your leadership on this and so many other dossiers. I, I really think this, the best is yet to come. Um, finally, Tommaso Dallavecchia has agreed to join us from European Schoolnet, a network of 34 ministries of education in Europe and a key participant in this ongoing dialogue. Tommaso, we're delighted to have you with us here too today and delighted to collaborate with European Schoolnet on quite a few other projects, uh, which we won't be talking about today, but we look forward to seeing you back on other occasions about that work. Um, and we look forward, of course, to hearing your views on the proposals for a recommendation and how we can work together to deliver the digital compass goals. A couple of housekeeping measures if I can. This session will run until 12.15, and despite the enormity of the topic at hand, we do plan to wrap up on time. It's an interactive session. We hope to have some room and scope for questions and interventions towards the end of the session. So please start warming up your voices, and please don't be shy when we call on you. Socrates once said that a school is like a log with a teacher on one end and a student on the other, each learning from the other one. We're looking forward to your active intervention later in this discussion and to your ongoing collaboration on this dossier and these important initiatives as they make their way through the system. The session's on the record. There are journalists in the room, and we are recording the session. And if you're using Twitter, and we encourage you to do so, the hashtag is hash Lisbon Council or anything else you might want. We'll be live tweeting the session, and we encourage you to do so as well. Finally, if you don't mind, I'd like to hand over to uh, Georgi, Dimit uh, Georgi Dimitrov. Georgi, tell us, please, what conclusions did you and the 27 EU member states reach in this very long dialogue you held? What are the key points of consensus, and how can we all contribute to making this strategy a success? Thanks for being with us. Thanks, all of you, for being with us. And Georgi, the floor is yours. You, you can use the lectern. If you want. I can speak also from here. That's perfectly okay. I'm, I'm equal. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Paul, um, for the invitation and delighted to be here with you after some time. Um, I'll go straight into the uh, presentation, uh, trying to keep it on time, but uh, focusing on what you've uh, suggested to, to, to do. The first thing uh, to say is that, um, yeah, it's very important to know what we are talking about and uh, we are um, uh, having a baseline and this is where I would like to just remind ourselves, even though you, Paul, mentioned already the problem. Um, we have two targets um, at the EU level. Uh, you just mentioned them. I don't want to go into the details here. I just want to draw your attention to one important aspect that um, we are obviously um, working towards those targets. In one case, we are at 55% uh, of achievement. So we want to reach 80. In the other case, we are at 9 million uh, ICT specialists. We want to reach 20. If we were to apply the compound growth rate of what we have done in the last five years, um, we are not going to reach it by a very huge margin. And I did, for the sake of it, my own calculation. This is not official commission position. Um, in the one case, it would take us 19 years to reach it. In the other case, it would take us 17 years. So, Main point is we are not on track. Second issue is that uh, we shop online, we communicate online, now we work online. But how digital is our education, really? So just a few numbers. Um, one out of three students attend schools uh, with a strategy uh, on digital for technology. One out of five pupils attend a uh, school which has a connectivity of uh, more than 100 megabits. Every one of you has a smartphone with 4G, 5G. Each of you is better connected than four out of five schools. 40% um, of teachers have, um, uh, are confident to use digital in schools. So this means 60 are not. And uh, last, uh, just a data point, and we can go on, is that uh, contrary to the myth of the digital native, in fact, um, one out of three students underperform in, the, in digital literacy. We want to bring down this number to less than 15. These are 14-year-olds. And uh, so basically, the main point here is there is some work to do in terms of our own target. So this is not something uh, somebody asks us. We have agreed to do this together with the member states in the digital compass. 
what uh, does it take to move from A to B uh, in a field which is, uh, of course, a sub subsidiarity field and um, characterized by li uh, limited competences? So there are two main points which I want to stress and then unpack with the proposals. The first is it takes higher ambition, so it, it needs that you know what you want to do differently. The second is you also need to cooperate to do it at the EU level. So this is the two fancy named council recommendations. Uh, we wanted to be very precise when we propose something so that we are clear on what we suggest. And um, the process which led us to this is a very interesting and unique one, at least in my experience in the Commission so far for uh, some 15 years. Uh, first and foremost, we propose to have a dialogue uh, already in 2020 on, in the Digital Education Action Plan. Uh, because the, the problems I've just described, they are not new. Uh, they have been there. They are just compounding and aggravating. This was confirmed in the Council conclusion, so the member states uh, said, yes, this is a good idea, let's do it. Uh, later on, uh, the President in the State of the Union asked the top um, uh, leaders, uh, essentially, uh, for their attention and to start a dialogue on digital skills. I don't think that this has been uh, the case in the past, at least not at that level. And um, then this was echoed by the European Council conclusions in um, uh, 21. So this was a bit the mandate for us to launch the structured dialogue that we organized with the member states in 2022. Just to be very brief on this, uh, member states nominated high-level coordinators, uh, which would be state secretary, sometimes minister, and these people would um, really convene um, different uh, experts from a variety of ministries. And I really want to stress that last point, variety of ministries. Uh, this is the so-called whole government approach that I'll come back to. Uh, and it involves usually people from education, from finance, from uh, infrastructure, digitalization, and so on. What we did, very practically speaking, is 27 uh, bilateral deep dives with each and every member state. And this would take normally like six hours, and then we would be going through uh, skills issues, through education issues, uh, infrastructure, connectivity. And this was the basis of the proposal that we have put forward just last month, uh, well, actually now two months ago. We will unpack this probably in the discussion, but uh, the main messages are um, coming to the provision of digital skills and the first recommendation that we really need to leverage on education and training systems and start as early as possible. Uh, we need to uh, recognize that uh, pupils are uh, exposed to digital devices and content in a very, very early age, sometimes as early as two, three. So we need guidance for teachers and parents. But we also need methodological instruments such as progression and assessment of digital skills because unless we assess, we don't really know what is happening. And unfortunately, this is absolutely not, um, let's say, the norm across the EU. Second point is that we have to think about the fundamental foundations of the digital world the same way we think about physics and gravity. So we need to go below the um, application level and think about what is algorithm. What does make AI work? And we need to teach these type of things as early as possible through subjects, for example, such as informatics. And for this, we need the appropriate teachers, which is a huge problem because in many, many member states, uh, the private sector directly competes with um, uh, essentially computer scientist um, uh, teachers. Well, it does not compete, it just takes them and then uh, the, the public system is effectively, um, yeah, uh, staying empty there. A third key point is that um, we need to also think about higher education in its role for developing digital skills beyond the vertical way of doing that, so not in an engineering uh, sort of a subject, but think about the humanities students who could perhaps uh, do data literacy or, or um, other types of advanced um, digital skills or, or data science. And this can lead to a very important cross-fertilization of skills and lead us further to the ICT specialist target. Last but not least, we need better transparency and signaling in terms of what uh, certifications uh, for digital skills really are. We need to think about it in a way which is uh, similar perhaps to what we do today with language learning, um, where we know more or less how uh, we actually are assessed in languages and this is not happening in the digital skills. On the enabling factors, um, what we learned from the member states is that we definitely need a national strategy and one uni uniform view from the different ministries on digital education and skills. This is um, surprisingly not often the case. 
We also need coordination, which involves everyone, and not outsourcing to the to, to education ministry. I just want to put it as bluntly as that, because education ministries are overwhelmed and underfunded. And this is normally the case. We need to think about digital skills for all teachers, not just for the ICT teachers. Um, and this is, I think, um, easy to understand, but surprisingly not the case. And I think I quoted um, some data there. And last but not least, there is a lot of money right now going on from the RRF in many member states. The emphasis here is on the adequate part of the investment in order to, repeat uh, to not repeat mistakes from the past, uh, such as putting a lot of money in hardware, which is very easy to spend, and of course, uh, wasting it by this. What we are going to do is the last slide I want to, share, uh, to show you in terms of us supporting the member states, because these all are tasks for the member states and our proposal is in the council right now. We want to build on the whole government approach and uh, formalize the high level group on digital education and skills, which would have a convening power and also steering the implementation of these recommendations. We also want to improve the evidence base and increase transparency because what I've shown you in terms of data points is uh, sometimes very old because there is not other data. And this is a shame in view of what we are actually talking about. Um, peer learning and exchange of best practices, traditional business of uh, the education, and we will continue to do this. And last but not least, we will increase um, the type of practical work we do through developing guidelines to support member states in a more voluntary fashion, such as what we did last year, um, uh, targeting teachers and developing um, guidelines for educators to deal with disinformation or uh, AI and data. Uh, I have prepared one question for the uh, final part. I don't know, uh, Paul, if you want me to raise it right now, but my question is effectively um, uh, related to the question of cooperation because you have um, mentioned it. And my question really is, um, uh, how can we make this cooperation which is necessary between um, also the member states but also at EU level, how can we make it stickier um, uh, so that uh, this subject does not uh, come up and down but remains um, as high as possibly on the agenda and um, how can we make actually member states work more uh, on this together? Uh, and with this I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you for that, Georgi. By the way, one of the pleasures of being a moderator at something like this is instead of answering questions, I can assign them. Um, so, Professor Vontra, that's your first question. How can we make a cooperation stickier? Um, uh, but before I drop that in your lap, let me say it's an absolute honor and pleasure to have you with us. Um, I've been hearing about this academy since it was first launched in 2016, a very high profile launch, a project that many people have been watching closely to see how it developed over the years. And for, from what I can tell, it's a great success. And it's a real honor and pleasure to have you with us here today for what I hope is merely the first of many visits. Uh, your presence in this debate is crucial. We look forward to learning more and hearing more. And I hope that by the end of this day, and perhaps already, you know and understand that today you're among friends. Thanks for coming. Uh, first of all, Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure and an honor. And by the way, I mean, I just started to learn many interesting things. So I, I hope I would be trying to give you uh, some, some discussion point to, to go. I prepared a few slides and uh, thank you. I, I don't know whether. Thank you. OK. Uh, I, I'll try to, to stick to a few minutes just to give you an idea of what we are doing with, the, with Apple, with the other companies on this major issue of digital competencies. And uh, uh, let, me, let me say before that, um, I mean, probably the, what we are trying to do is to move a little bit the discussion from uh, the theme of what we should teach on how we should teach, because that's the major point here. On, on, to, to solve all the issue, the pending issue that uh, you have been mentioning before. So first of all, I mean, th this is the story that is related to this new campus, my university. My university is the University of Napoli Federico II, is one of the oldest uh, in the world and was founded uh, around 800 years ago by this guy that was uh, Federico II of Svivia. 
there was a, a very talented guy and they had this idea to create the first state university because and contrary to other universities for, like Bologna or Padova or other one, uh, this was the first university where professors were paid by the government, by the state, not by the students. So this is the, the, the major difference. Okay, I mean, uh, we, um, we started out this project of our, our new campus in, in 2000, 2002, and uh, uh, the idea was to create a, a new site for the uh, School of Engineering. Um, but, I mean, uh, uh, we started to create these new buildings, and uh, uh, as very often in your life happens, I mean, uh, we were quite lucky that while we were preparing, finishing our construction, uh, we uh, got this uh, proposal from Apple to start working to get together. And this actually uh, was very important to us because it helped us to or orient a little bit, in, a little better what we were doing and to change a little bit the way we wanted to work on this uh, uh, high tech and in particular in digital ed education. This is the campus. The red buildings are those that are already being completed, while the others are, are under construction. We even uh, bought new areas around because we are really uh, overwhelmed by requests by other companies to join us. And uh, as you can see, there are many initiatives. Actually, I, I will be try to, to give you, these are the companies that are working with, with us. It's both international company like Apple or Cisco or Accenture. But even, I mean, a national company like, uh, uh, I mean, uh, banks or any, uh, or uh, the Italian railway company. And uh, we work very close with the regional government at the national government, but particularly with the regional government, because uh, this was our way to have a, a bigger impact on our area. Uh, there was very important, and we were lucky that our current regional government um, is really supporting us, not only in terms of money, that's important, of course, and we, we have a lot of money from the region, from the European <laughs> Union, but, but particularly because we are sharing ideas. We, we work together on a common vision on uh, 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 training, education, innovation, and also the creation on, on new uh, enterprises like startups and so on. Uh, what we do in the campus, uh, apart, of course, we, we, uh, in the campus we have uh, the classical engineering classes, uh, courses. We, uh, he, there we keep the, we have the um, one third of the uh, bachelor uh, degree uh, um, courses. The, the rest is done in our uh, traditional site. It is very close to the football stadium that, uh, I mean, as you can understand, make us very close to our football team. I mean, as you can understand. Uh, anyway, so we, we do three things in our campus. First of all, we do training and knowledge transfer. The second is technology transfer. So we work with company on open innovation project. And finally, we try to foster startup creation and acceleration that can be both born inside our university from research idea, research project, but also we accept comp uh, startups ideas and proposals from outside the, 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 the university area. Uh, these are the, 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 the list of the academy that we started. First of all, we started with Apple. It is not only the oldest, but also the biggest. And I will, be, uh, I will give you some more details in, in a while. And then we have uh, other initiatives that are very, uh, they, they share the same, the similar approach. If you want to give digital competence and high-tech competences that, that want to be very practical, you need to work with companies. There is no way out. And uh, we are quite, I, I am a university professor. I am proud the, of the fact that we, as a university, are very capable of providing a very good education. But this is mostly, you know, methodological. It's uh, uh, theoretical. While probably we do need to be practical. And this is why we uh, are very grateful to Apple that we have been working on this idea that to, 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 we need to couple the classical university approach with a more open approach, and uh, uh, also to, uh, to solve the problems that are very typical for Italian institutions that we are, I mean, shocked by bureaucracy. We cannot change the way we organize our university classes and so on. So this is, uh, let me give you a few details about the Developer Academy. We started in 2016. 
the idea is not about coding. It's, we don't want to work on creating coders or programmers. Our idea is to create a, 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 a sort of a new figure that is the one of the developer. I mean, uh, let me say an inventor of the app. Someone can invent, can create apps by talking with small and medium enterprises, even with the government, with other entities, I mean, to try to do, in practice, digital transformation. And to do that, you need, of course, technical skills, so we teach coding, but you do need also, uh, you know, design competencies, because it's important, the app uh, world is made of design, of uh, user experience, user interface, accessibility. And also, we support our students, we're giving them professional growth skills, like, you know, soft skills, and also some business skills. The, the, the course lasts nine months, and usually every year we select 350 students. This year we, we just uh, closed the call uh, and we got 2,000 uh, submissions this year. That was impressive. And 40%, almost 40% are from abroad, outside Italy, because this is an, the, the project that was meant to be an international project with Apple. So all teaching is done in English. And we are very happy that we still, I mean, we continue to attract students literally from all over the world. This year we had submission from Mexico to Australia, really, all over the world. And uh, that's very nice. Uh, one important thing is about the background. And uh, so I, 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 I hope to give you a, a few insights about the question that you, Jorge, were, were posing before. Um, we, 50% uh, of the students have, have, do have a technical background. So can, let me say computer science, also engineering in general. But many students are coming with uh, other backgrounds. So humanities, design, uh, social science, political science, uh, communication science, and so on. And this is very important because we uh, are discovering that, uh, of course, I mean, someone that has a, a computer background is more, you know, uh, as an easier approach to learning how to, do, to create an app. But uh, you, uh, if you want to do digital transformation, you do need all these competencies because you do need to have an open mind. Um, as far as the age, we range from 18 to 57. I mean, the, the, the 57 guy was an Australian guy that I mean, came to, to, to us last year, and now he opened his startup in Adelaide. And uh, I mean, and also from the gender point of view, we are very happy that we are, I mean, leaning slowly, uh, going to a, a quite balanced approach for a technical school, of course. Uh, uh, the, what is making the academy experience different from others is the, the way we teach. We are, uh, with Apple, we are uh, adopting this uh, uh, methodology that is called challenge-based learning. Challenge-based learning is purely experiential learning. It's, it's lab learning. So we, we, uh, we want our students to learn by doing. And uh, there are many approaches that try to do this. so, uh, like, for example, the flip, uh, flip a classroom and so on. But the major difference here is that uh, um, we teach, we work with students to uh, let them learn by, in, in a practical way, the technologies, but the way they learn is by developing entire projects that they choose. So we ask our students to use a specific technology by, um, and they need to develop an app or a game or, uh, or another project, but the topic of the game, the topic of the, uh, the, 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 the app is, uh, is uh, a choice of our students and the property is our, our student. So students are very much involved in the learning process because they are working on their own ideas, and this is very important. And so you will see, I mean, uh, uh, projects that are really, I mean, uh, broad uh, with, the, with, with, the, uh, with all the possible, you know, commitment by, 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 by our students. Uh, an important part of the you know, learning process is uh, our spaces. So. Uh, I will I mean, briefly show some pictures. These are, this is a classroom. So you can see there is no bench, no desk for the professor. We use very limited, I mean, PowerPoint or pages or these tools and so on, because it's really, really practice. And by the way, let me put this right. I don't teach in the academy because, as I always say, you can't teach a new tree to an old dog. I am an old dog. I've been teaching computer networks and engineering for 
30 years of my life. I, I'm boring because I use PowerPoint. And while here, the topic is to focus on how you can develop your skill, how you can develop your project. And so you, we have been selecting I mean, brilliant young mentors. They're both very good in teaching, but very good in developing project. That's, that's an important part. These are uh, the other part of the spaces that we, I mean, uh, designed for increasing the interaction. All the projects are done in, in groups, so, and so students must create their own groups. These are examples of the apps that were developed last year. And by the way, we uh, have been very proud of the fact that uh, a couple of them were selected to be uh, in the final uh, number of apps that were um, um, uh, selected for the worldwide uh, developer uh, conference uh, it, that com was completed last, last week. And uh, a few of them, many of them, uh, they have an, an, um, a social approach. Many students choose to develop their skill by creating apps that can be uh, useful for good. For example, uh, Anne is a, the, 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 an app that was developed to help uh, students with uh, visual and hearing disabilities to communicate. So it's, it's transforming a, 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 an iPhone in a braille device, just to give you an example. And others have been developed to support blind people or uh, people with hearing problems and so on. And this, it, it's a very nice part of our project. Uh, finally, um, a, a few um, I mean, uh, details about how we help our students to find their uh, dream job. Because of course, I mean, uh, these students came out of our academy with very, uh, very tough skill, very good skill. They are very much required by the market. But we don't want just to get in, into the job market. We want to help them in find the, the, dream, the job they dream of. And so every year uh, at the, in the graduation week we, that we are going to have in the, on the 28th, 29th, and 30th of June, on the 28th and 29th, we, we have this future fair. That is an event where we invite companies, around 100 companies from really all over the world, from the big company, from Shazam or from, 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 uh, from ASOS, for example, to the small startup that they want to hire our students. And uh, it's, we are very uh, proud of the way we arrange this event because it's a very interactive. I mean, the students, the students, they don't present themselves with a piece of paper or they, with their LinkedIn page, but they introduce themselves, present themselves with their own project. And I guess this is the best way to uh, help the student to show I mean, how talented they are and also to help companies to, to select the best possible talent for their need. And that, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, George. I thought there was going to be a video, wasn't there? Are we, are we skipping yeah, the video? I, mean, we, we can, if, I, I don't know if you want to let me show it now or later on. Uh, well, I think now would be okay, better. Sure. It's, 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 all, it's all teed up and ready to go. Preserves were once produced, today ideas are cultivated and talents are produced. Opened in 2015, the Federico, the second university campus, through the integrated use of European funds, represents one of the most successful urban regeneration interventions where teaching, research, and technology transfer coexist. The turning point came in 2016 with the opening of the first and unique European Apple Academy. The arrival of Cupertino's company, the vision of the Federico II University, which continues to create spaces with the support of the European Union, and the strategy of the Campania region, which invests in human capital and young talents, have attracted towards the Polo di San Giovanni a series of subjects, public and private, 
and large information technology companies which have given life to numerous academies and incubators favoring the formation of spin-offs and startups. This is how the main hub of the regional innovation ecosystem was born, offering an inclusive program of digital and top-level hub skills to share the skills necessary to manage, create and guide the digital, economic and social transition underway. An opportunity for knowledge, growth and entry into the world of work for young people from all over the world. In questo meraviglioso luogo ospitiamo persone provenienti da tutto il mondo, insegniamo loro capacità innovative e li prepariamo per il futuro. Tutto ciò è stato reso possibile grazie alla costruzione di un ecosistema innovativo che contiene accademie, laboratori, start-up ed incubatori di impresa. L'offerta formativa delle Academies è unica nel suo genere. Fino ad oggi ha formato più di 3.000 studenti e il 95% di questi studenti oggi lavora in aziende locali, nazionali ed internazionali che gravitano intorno al campus. Le Academy sono incredibili perché consentono a tutti, anche a chi non ha competenze tecnologiche come me, di acquisire delle skills che ti permettono di creare soluzioni tecnologiche in grado di rendere migliore la vita delle persone. Ed è quello che io e il mio team abbiamo fatto in Sudafrica, collaborando con una ONG locale. Inoltre io sono di San Giovanni, quindi ho potuto constatare il cambiamento positivo che le Academy hanno portato nel mio quartiere, perché ha riportato di nuovo la speranza. Adesso le persone sono fiere di essere di San Giovanni, grazie a questo edificio che ha portato innovazione, educazione e istruzione alla portata di tutti. Wow, and since, since it's June, I think summer holidays in the south of Europe are on many of our minds. And exactly, and I was just thinking, um, maybe we do the next one of these uh, on your turf in, um, in Naples. It, 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 would, it would be an honor and a pleasure, and I will bet a large part of this room would come with us. You're all invited. <laughs> we wait for an invitation from the professor. Um, <laughs> okay, good. Eva, I've, um, I've already said so many nice things about you, I made myself blush. Um, but uh, let me say, um, we're delighted you could be here. Everything I said is true, and uh, the floor is yours. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for um, having me. It's very difficult to match the two uh, previous presentation as well as the inspirational uh, video of what we can achieve um, in Europe. Um, Paul, you probably know, and I have said that to you, it's very difficult to decline an invitation that comes from you. We've been partnering and collaborating on this and few other topics for many, many years now. I say this because um, um, lately I have found myself to not being able uh, to attend a number of debates and discussions that are related to skills, and perhaps there was a purpose to that. Um, because I believe that um, I was probably among f a handful of MEPs more than 10 years ago that we've brought that topic on the agenda um, in the European Parliament. Um, and back then, there was not much interest on the topic. And I say this um, not to say we did that, but what I want to say is that we seem to be having the same conversation for many years now. Um, and this is my worry. Um, and I kind of feel one of the reasons of not taking part of some of this discussion is, yes, there were other legislative files, but I always feel that I over-repeat myself, and I don't think I can add that much value um, to the discussion. So with the risk of over-repeating um, some points that I have brought, um, um, in a similar audience uh, over the past couple of uh, years, I will share um, a little bit of, of, of my views here um, today with you uh, when it comes to um, the digital skills. Um, of course, uh, the topic, uh, uh, you know, 
touches almost everything that a lot of us within the European institutions work on at the moment when it comes to our economic future, when it comes to our resilience, uh, when it comes to our security. Um, and I very much wish uh, that we will start to see the digital skills topic and the topic of education as uh, no longer something that is reserved for uh, the tech gigs or for the ICT professionals but we uh, more within regions and member states it will under will understand that it's you know it affects many of those analog jobs uh, but most importantly uh, to understand that it's about the leadership on local regional national and European level to properly um, understand that um, and I think the pandemic definitely raised our awareness uh, of, of those uh, sensitivities. Um, but I think it also showed us uh, that um, it's not just, uh, you know, the older generation that perhaps would need these skills. Uh, the digital native generations are uh, also not developing those skills enough in a sophisticated manner uh, either. Um, so this is why I believe uh, the European Union has been right to name the current year uh, the year of skills. I think some of us have called for that, uh, as I said, for many years. We have indeed called for uh, putting the topic of education and also digital um, and, and tech topics uh, at the highest uh, point of uh, the European uh, Council uh, agenda as well. Um, so I'm glad there's more emphasis and I very much hope member states uh, will recognize that, but that also the European institutions and particularly the Parliament would not just perceive this as a national competence, but would see that the European Union can do uh, more at the EU level. And that's my first point that I'll shortly elaborate. The second point is related to uh, funding. I think money talks and not everyone uh, has it, uh, but also here, uh, public-private partnership, as we just saw, are absolutely vital um, and essential. And my last point, and I probably cannot dwell too much on that point necessarily, uh, but um, I think we have to reinvent our educational systems and the way uh, we uh, teach um, and most importantly, uh, how uh, we do it. Um, so on my first point, um, I think, um, the European Union can do far more to coordinate uh, the teaching of uh, digital skills. Um, as again, the European Parliament doesn't have that many uh, um, options of what it can actually do, but some of you know we've had the uh, Conference of Europe, uh, uh, Conference of the Future of Europe recently uh, wrapping up. I have pushed hard there, the digital skills are included in the recommendations. Uh, again, uh, I thought the conference will be forward looking for the next 15, 20 years to come, yet we still had to come to some of those uh, basic tasks um, within uh, that uh, exercise. Um, Fundamentally, this is because uh, digital skills uptake is about ensuring, in my opinion, the level playing field uh, in EU um, um, member states, but also most importantly, the single market. Uh, why I say this is because if you uh, compare uh, Finland and the Netherlands, who are some of the front runners, uh, you can see uh, that Romania and Bulgaria, for example, are uh, at the back of that list, uh, which one could uh, sum up and say that older member states have the uh, infrastructure to teach those uh, digital skills uh, because uh, this brings more investments, which gives them uh, more funds uh, to invest into education. When it comes to newer member states, uh, the opposite is true, and as a consequence, our economies, uh, I believe, risk uh, further uh, divergence. Uh, and this is why I think uh, it's where the European Union uh, can step in, uh, and it is not 
not about passing regulation, uh, but it's creating the right targets, uh, the right tools, the funding streams uh, to ensure that uh, all European citizens have access to this uh, type of skills uh, education. And I think when it comes to targets, uh, Georgi mentioned the important targets uh, and also gave uh, an example of some of the tools uh, that this uh, can be done. Then when it comes to, uh, to the actual financing, uh, uh, I really do think we are not investing enough. Of course, before that, we need the right strategy, the right goals and aims and vision, most importantly. Um, but uh, we need a better collaboration between the member states, the EU, and the private uh, sector. Um, we saw where we are. Uh, we are behind, in a way, our targets. It might be difficult uh, to reach uh, those goals, uh, but we need the ambitions actions uh, as well. Um, I think uh, this means that we have to tackle the divide. Uh, and I think once it was one of my um, um, points I've made at one of the meetings organized by the Lisbon Council, this digital divide is there. I think the World Economic Forum put out a report almost 15 or more years ago think, talking about the digital divide. We are still talking about it today. Um, this means uh, actionable um, uh, goals are uh, urgently uh, needed to tackle that divide between the haves and the have-nots uh, across uh, <coughs> Europe. Um, then uh, when it comes to changing our educational system and uh, lifelong learning, um, um, most of you are experts on the topic, so you know uh, much better of how to do that, but maybe a small example, even today, um, you know, uh, as a parent, um, I would believe that when you send pupils to, to, to be uh, schooled, uh, they have to come back with the basic skills, uh, writing, uh, reading, uh, arithmetic. I think a basic skill uh, has to be also the digital literacy, which will, should encompass uh, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, uh, data science, uh, and be part of the core list of capabilities that one uh, can possess and, and take. Um, I think digital skills should be modules in all qualifications, especially at secondary and university uh, levels. Um, and, um, you know, um, uh, an important point, I have seen it in, in my own country, and I'm sure other countries have the same. When it comes to ICT professionals, uh, the ones that have sufficient skills to enter the workplace should be able to do so without having to go uh, to university to get a recognized qualification. We have have certain um, private, so to say, entities and, and universities um, that are able to um, support uh, and find ways to recognize the digital skills um, in the workplace across um, the single uh, market. And finally, I would uh, emphasize the point again on public-private partnership because I believe they're the key component to uh, the learnability principle and the lifelong um, uh, learning. So these are just few ideas. All of you very well um, know them, um, but um, you know we are spending a lot of time and political capital to build the digital single market. Um, my worry is, would we have the prepared workforce for that? Um, and some of you might worry about to have that prepared workforce for the private sector, but I also worry for the public sector. It is not just about using um, uh, um, a device. It is not just about using some of the well-known applications and programs out there. Uh, it is much more, and it comes to how you analyze data, how you, um, uh, you know, uh, um, react when there is a huge disinformation campaign uh, aimed at your country, um, how do you use AI to better enable your decision making and do it faster. Um, so there is a whole lot out there for the public sector uh, to be prepared in order to truly be able to answer the challenges we are going to be facing with the upcoming uh, technological revolutions, which will come faster they will get uh, uh, better, um, and perhaps our societies will be more and more unprepared. Um, so from uh, uh, the position of a policymaker, I am worried uh, how those revolutions uh, will uh, impact our uh, democratic um, 
systems uh, and we could only uh, feel reassured it would be a smooth ride and continue to be optimistic on the tech point if our societies are prepared, if they're skilled, um, if they're uh, ready to um, understand uh, the benefits that uh, technology can bring, but also understand the perils um, and be able to uh, tackle them in a common way. Thank you. Thank you, Eva. Um, I, I, I share your sense of deja vu in this, uh, in this debate quite often. Um, but I also shake it off, including on mornings like this, uh, because the issues are still very much uh, there with us. Uh, but thanks to initiatives uh, like the one uh, Georgi uh, sketched out, I actually think perhaps this time we make some progress uh, and we can talk about this in a year with some new issues on the table. Um, although you put uh, the key ones there, funding, how we teach, European competences. I think these are all areas that should very much be a part of this reflection as we go forward. Tommaso, there's no harder job in the world than coming on after the Rolling Stones. Um, so I'm, I'm, um, I, 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 I'm, I'm sorry you got that particular slot this time, but you did. We're delighted you can be with us. Uh, we look forward to hearing what you have to say, what you think of the proposals for a recommendation. And of course, my favorite question of all, how we can come together and make progress on this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I feel the same, uh, pretty much. Uh, I heard uh, great uh, speeches and intervention. Uh, these initiatives are not new to me, of course, but hearing from you, uh, uh, it really made a difference, and I think you put, you shed such a positive light into these um, initiatives and how they interconnect, which I, I already feel expired. So uh, thank you for having me, and it was already a, a great learning opportunity for me. And of course, I'll try also to answer your question, which is as difficult as uh, speaking after these um, uh, wonderful uh, colleagues. What, how do we feel, what do we feel, what do we think about the recommendations? Uh, first of all, we, <laughs> it's not only that we think, we, we trust the Commission. We've been um, uh, working, collaborating with the Commission for as long as I could remember. Um, I've been at European Schoolnet since 2012, but of course European Schoolnet have been an organization, a, a thing since uh, 1997. And we trust when the commission comes with recommendation and guidelines and initiatives uh, and suggestions that we can uh, bring forward. And I love the title of this session, which is uh, really turning ambition into reality because that's the part we are most passionate about, turning this recommendation into something tangible and impactful. So we, of course, have our own view, but also our position towards this recommendation doesn't come as a, as a surprise, the content of these recommendations, of course. We've been, as mentioned, um, working with and for the Commission, but uh, most importantly, we've been part of the Delta uh, group, for instance, on digital skills and education for several years. And we contributed to this dialogue as much as also our member ministries of education have contributed to these findings. So we, of course, are impressed, and I must uh, also praise the, the great process that the Commission went through to uh, gather these uh, recommendations. This structured dialogue is something that is uh, definitely something uh, very ambitious and brave to undertake. And uh, of course, as a, a network of ministries of education ourselves, we've been in dialogue with our members for more than 25 years and of course reaching a point where you gather a consensus or a common line of action, it's something that goes uh, uh, really beyond the average capacity. So it's, uh, it's really ambitious, it's really brave of you and also you cover activities and areas of education that we personally do not cover. So we really focus on formal education and especially compulsory education. We go from pre-primary to secondary education, upper secondary, already there the complexity is immense. We're talking about seven, 27 member states but as uh, Giorgio Ventre mentioned in his uh, initiative, the regional part, the local part intervention, even at the granularity of the decision taking in terms of equipment for digital education, of infrastructure, pedagogical approaches and trainings, 
it's demanded uh, very much since the 90s to really local authorities, which have a great power, great responsibility, and often they might like a uh, lack of the, uh, the competency and the capacity to take uh, on board uh, and uh, implement the national framework that, that it's uh, um, uh, impulsed by um, recommendations such as this one. So, um, but I can, uh, of course, also uh, perhaps comment on a few elements that are more uh, resonating with our remit and um, mission. And for instance, is um, really appreciated the focus on the cross-curricular approach to the development of digital competencies and skills. Giorgio Ventre put it very, very well. It's very much about the how you teach certain uh, capacities and skills more than the content, the what, and um, the, the, the policy. So that's absolutely something that we've seen growing as a, as a consciousness also among the population of teachers as well as ministries of education over the years. And we started, for instance, um, leading the educational component on the EU Code Week, which is one of the initiatives that is mentioned in the, in the recommendation in 2018. And, and we made the shift already back then from uh, informatics or coding as a separate subject or uh, to something that can be integrated also instrumentally throughout the curriculum and across different subjects and disciplines. So that's definitely something that we see it's powerful and effective and will turn um, promises and expectations into reality. Then on the opposite, the uh, claim of, uh, and uh, the suggestion uh, to consider including informatics as a subject, of course, comes with the opposite consideration, but of course, this is a process that anyway, most ministries of education has, uh, have undertaken. This is a fundamental skills nowadays. Um, the foundation of really what lays behind uh, a device or a machine or a program, it's something that we all should be very familiar with. So um, then the, the process and the path to implementation, of course, we know it's long and uh, it takes many, many players to, um, to, uh, to concretize. Public-private part partnership is also an immense, uh, it's something that very resonates with what we do and how we do it. Uh, of course, we have an initiative such as the Future Classroom Lab that really bring together the ed tech providers, IT companies, schools, ministries of education, researchers, universities to experiment with technology, which leads me to another point which we really appreciate, which is the teachers as key uh, partners or even uh, main um, enablers uh, also of innovation and digital education. The Future Classroom Lab model has been replicated hundreds of times across Europe because it offers a possibility to teachers to engage into decision-making process regarding the equipment to uh, have in a school where we come uh, to talk about digital education and where it comes to pedagogical approaches and, and practices to, uh, to implement. So it's very important to have that uh, really clearly in mind to make uh, really this, this recommendation have an impact. How do we uh, foster this collaboration at European level, not only at the level of the, minist the, of the ministry, which, uh, which of course is very important, but also at the level of, of practitioners, which is more and more the case. Very happy also to, of course, see an, uh, uh, a focus on, on evidence. It's absolutely important that we document what happens, to, uh, we make visible what is uh, intangible, and um, we want to measure as much as you do the impact as this initiative would have and will have in the uh, learners. And um, <coughs> however, we have to be careful with the element of assessment, which is mentioned. Uh, how do we include a very strong summative assessment policies into, uh, into these practices? Because uh, the success of, of initiatives such as the one presented by Giorgio Ventre, I think it also lays on the tangible results, but not necessarily the man man measurable results that the students achieve. It's not just about learning outcomes, it's about really their mindset and how they transform as citizens. And 
I could talk for hours, but of course I, I really want to also leave time and space for a contribution from the public. My message from my side uh, in, and from uh, European Schoolnet, we, we are in a very privileged position. We do not need to take a position because we are agnostic <laughs> towards uh, many measures and policies that our member states want to achieve. There's a great diversity. What it will work in Malta might not work in France and vice versa. We learned that uh, during our uh, event that we just ran until yesterday. But a better and stronger consciousness and consensus across European states should be uh, sought and achieved. And I'm sure this recommendation will help building the momentum that we all need to uh, be more ambitious towards our targets. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, I said this was going to be an interactive session, and now's the time when we count on you to do a little bit of work. Um, by the way, for those of you, uh, if and when you do get the microphone, if you could start by identifying yourself and saying where you're from. Hi, Julia. Uh, you can, you'll be first. Um, I, I, I'll, first, I'm going to abuse the microphone um, and ask a question myself, which is for uh, <coughs> Professor Ventre. Um, amazing uh, w what you said and, 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 and what you showed. But I was missing a little bit the application relevance and potential of the Apple Developer Academy for the broader issues we're talking about now. And, and by that, I mean, how can we replicate this? Um, obviously, it's difficult. But I'd like you to reflect a little bit on what the secret sauce is. Um, Eva mentioned some things, funding. And um, of course, you mentioned yourself. The, the, the confluence of knowledge that you had a first-rate university there that could be mobilized. You also have very nice weather, which I think I was the only one who mentioned. Um, and, and presumably a little bit of luck. You have a tremendous partner in Apple, and Apple can't do 50 of these things in Europe. But my question to you is, what is, what is the secret sauce? How, what, what are some of the ideas there that might be used, perhaps on a smaller scale, on a medium scale, but just to get skills and knowledge and to borrow Eva's words, opportunity and hope out into some of the communities where we know the skills acquisition needs to go? Well, this is a tough question, a nasty question. Nasty. <laughs> no, uh, <laughs> no, no, actually, I mean, the, the, we were talking with Sir Noor exactly about this. I mean, it's, uh, uh, the, 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 the secret was that we were very lucky that we were sharing the same vision, even being such different partners. I mean, now, we are an 800 years old university, an Italian university that means, you know, bureaucracy, whatever, and, and they are Apple. I mean, they are, you know, the, the biggest and the richest company, the, 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 the most open to innovation. And in spite of that, I mean, we, we realized we were really interested in um, having a great impact huh, on, local, on a local and a global scale, that is, is important, and that, we were really open-minded to put the best we can put in, 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 this, in this achievement. And uh, so this, is, this was part of the, 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 the secret. And uh, the third part, the, the second part, is the one that to uh, from the very beginning, we started involving the local government, the regional government. Because it brings you to the real issue on the development. Because you should do that. By having in mind, you need to have an impact on number of people that get, uh, I mean, a job in the area. The, the way you attract more companies to invest in your area, there was an, another major effect. Uh, I, I would say that since we started the Apple Academy, the number of positions that were uh, growing in, area, in our area, by, by the way, I, Napoli is an IT city. We have uh, several big companies. but. The, we, we had a, 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 an improvement in the number, uh, a growth in number. It was impressive, around 40%. And so this is probably the, 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 the starting point. And finally, let me say we need to, I mean, uh, probably it's needed to follow a global approach. I mean, you, be, you must be following what are the global trends. And by, I mean, we were with Apple. So this, for, for, for us, was very easy. And also, as an university, you tend to be global in terms of even to, uh, uh, adding new knowledge to do research at the global scale. But still, you need to work on a local scale because you want to have an impact on school. And for example, uh, all the things have been uh, said on the school, on the environment in school is very important. And we do need to, to work in bringing 
this competence is from the very early stage. I mean, at the first grade, second grade, and, 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 and by including all the innovation, there are AI, I mean, the cyber security, data science, uh, uh, I mean, all the world of digital transformation, and it's very much important on this. Okay, thank you. By the way, I don't know what, what your house is like, but uh, the younger generation has all of the IT knowledge in, um, in mind. Whenever there's a problem, uh, they're the ones we go to to, to fix it. Um, yeah, Julianne, um, would you like to ask a question? Then we'll come to Hilda Hardeman um, as well. Hi. We'll take a couple first. Um, I Alice, could up? you give Hilda the Oh, microphone? I'll sit down. I think everyone can see. Hi, um, I'm Julianne of OneRapid Bismarck with Lie Detectors. Thank you so much for addressing this important issue. Um, we're an um, independent media literacy organization that works with journalists, children, and teachers across Europe. And I have to say that what you're addressing has enormous resonance on the ground. So what we're finding is that teachers want these skills. Um, we're a friend of eTwinning, and so and it's wonderful to see that eTwinning is making this such a continuous priority. So we're continuously t training the teachers there. We can see that the journalists who we use as experts to transfer the skills are very, very interested. So we're lucky to be working with amazing journalists, including the European Broadcasting Union. We can see that mayors on the ground are increasingly wanting to do this. You know, this is helpful for them as well. To media literacy also equals political literacy to a certain extent. Um, and even the war does soften and open some doors, in fact when you go further east and further to the, to the edges of, uh, the eastern edges of Europe. My question therefore, and it's for Tommaso and perhaps the rest of the board, but specifically you said something on evaluation. The one question that keeps coming up again and again, apart from funding, um, is when is enough, you know, what is enough? When is digital literacy training enough? How much do you need to do? What is impact? And you said that you're working on evaluation. We're now starting a scientific study with the University of um, Munich to work with several students and control groups and things. But I'd be really interested to see what the, you know, what, what other evaluation um, processes are underway because I think that will really set standards and set, I don't know, um, kind of levels of how much is enough, you know? What levels do we need to uh, achieve? And therefore, what do teachers need to be able to do? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Before we come back to the panel, we'll go to Hilda. We'll take a few questions and comments from the audience first. Thank you very much, Hilda Herdeman. I'm, the, I'm a commission official. I'm the director general of the publications office of the European Union. What do we do? Uh, core of our business is to publish European law like an official journal. We turn decisions into applicable law, but we also are in charge of the data portal for open data from all European countries except Russia. Um, at all levels, um, we prepare apps for European in Union institutions to reach citizens. Uh, and of course, um, I heard what was said by my colleague uh, Georgia. I, I think we need the skills that you uh, grow at the Apple Academy in Naples. We need them in the schools. We need them in the public administration. Um, and when I hear you, uh, Professor Ventry, talk about your fair, uh, at the end of the year, um, the dream job of these people, uh, I hear that you have companies present, but I wanted to ask you, do you have schools, <laughs> public administrations present? I would be very much a candidate uh, to be able to be at one of your fairs. I look for these type of confidence. Uh, I think they're very important uh, in spreading the word, in spreading the skills. I have people who work for me, data scientists, civil engineers, who earn with me, I think, far less than they would earn in the private sector. And when I ask them, what brings you to us? Yeah. They say, because I want to work for Europe. Yeah. So how can I get those people who want to work for Europe in contact with those students in your academy? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, that was a, <laughs> <laughs> a, lo a, lo a lovely intervention. And I hope that you will find a way to follow up on that because your instinct on the no, problem no, I mean, is, uh, is there. But can, I, can we take one more from the floor and then we sure. can come to you on that particular point? Thomas, would you like to join and then we'll come back to our, to our panel. Thank you very much, Thomas Jorgensen from the European University Association. So we have, what it says on the can, we represent about 870 members across the whole continent. And, and, and thanks a lot, I'm extremely good points, good points made. I, I found the Naples 
example really exciting because it not only it's a it's it's a good example and Federico Secondo is a, is a member of EUA of course um, but it also shows sort of the fault lines because what you say you know we want to escape the bureaucracy I, I suppose you want to escape Anwar you want to escape the accreditation agency which you can understand because Italy, of course, has program accreditation. It becomes very technical. You know, it's difficult to set up a program. It's difficult to run it. So, and we see that a solution is you take it out to the tech transfer office, which is probably a separate legal entity, and you can sort of escape that way. But it also shows the fault line. So who is doing the quality assurance on a skills program that is done in a public-private partnership? The good part of the story is this is a way we can do things more efficient. The bad part of the story is, why is this at all necessary? Why is this not mainstreamed across, across higher education in, in, in that system? And I think that, that really shows the, the, the sort of the technical, political frameworks that are, um, that are behind some maybe the slow, the slow progress here. And I'll just, if, if I can, just one other short example is, um, there are many different discourses about public-private partnerships in, in Europe. Uh, many countries would love to do what you do and think this is great and we work great with Apple and, and no harm done. Others would be very skeptical and say, well, this is a threat to public values. Why do we let big tech in on education? Um, and, and I'm just referring here, you know, strengthen their monopolistic discussion uh, position against our public values. Um, uh, these things should be should be done only public, and and I think in in the recommendations, one of the solutions here is of course to have uh, mechanisms that sort of uh, make a more level playing field technologically. Uh, uh, we're very very supportive of the recommendations, and and particularly the interoperability parts in the education in the education recommendation is is important. So just just point to say there are there are some technical political fundamentals uh, that came very well out in, in this, and I think are the ones we should discuss. Okay, thanks. We, I think, Tommaso, the first question was to you. We'll come back to you, and we'll come to each of our panelists in turn, and you can take, take these as you will. Uh, Julianne had a question for you, and I believe a few others, too. Thank you very much. I'll, I'll try to, to be brief, and, but thank you very much for the question. It's, it, it brings also the, the, the elements of digital education into the, into the in, sorry, and digital citizenship into the equation, so we, we make it a bit more complex also what we are debating about, but, but definitely that's absolutely in, important, and this is something that we cover definitely within eTwinning, with the friends of eTwinning, so it's great to have your support there as well, but also in, in, in dedicated initiatives like the Better Internet for Kid and, and Safer Internet Day. So there's, there's many campaigns that are running and um, which of course are, are bringing this, this topic further. You ask when it w would it be enough? And, and I would love that at some point we would reach the point that would say, okay, that's, that's satisfactory, we, it's enough, we can, <laughs> we can move to another another subject, uh, for instance, but I'm afraid that it's uh, media literacy is something that is constantly evolving. And of course, when we have um, the um, generative AI, for instance, item yeah, okay. on the table, it brings already a completely new, a new element into, into what kind of skills we need to develop uh, for consider our students media literate. And then we, of course, um, it's a very good point, uh, the one you made about about evaluation and, and, and what is mentioned in the recommendation, it goes a bit more towards the direction of making sure that the digital technology and the digital practices that are integrated in school are uh, based on evidence, are based on studies that prove that those are beneficial for the learning of the students and, uh, and, and their well-being as well, which is another element that of course it's very much connected with, with the risks posed by, by digital technology. We've been running and we will continue running policy experimentation uh, with the support of the Erasmus Plus funding. But of course we have to, and, and we set up specific validation uh, pilots for uh, teaching and learning approaches and, uh, and practices as much as we do for um, educational technology solutions. So that's, uh, that's, that is a point. But of course, uh, there's much more to do, and I think the recommendation uh, pledge for a broader support to these studies, because they need to be really, uh, and the evaluation and the impact measurement, because it takes huge amount of resources 
it's all worth that kind of investment, but sometimes it's not, simply not, not okay. there to make, I'm afraid. So I hope I answered somehow th partially your th question. Th th thank, thank you, Tommaso. By the way, even in addition to all the nice things I said about you earlier, you are, as far as I'm concerned, the hardest working person in show business. Um, and I mean that. You always seem so casual, relaxed, and generous with your time. And I know a little bit about how much on the other side of that. So thank you for that. I know you have to leave. Would you care to say a few kind, a few, few final thoughts on where this debate is, and then we'll send you back over to the European Parliament for the other important work there. Yeah, thank you very much. Unfortunately, I need to be there at 12.30, so I'll, I'll need to rush after uh, this brief uh, comment. But I'll make a point because I, I know that there is a couple of people from permanent representations today with us, um, and it's kind of one of my reoccurring points, so I have to make it again, uh, make sure it sticks. <laughs> um, well, um, and, and, and here I will, um, you know, um, kind of um, take the example of the country we've been in a way singling out today and for very good reasons. Um, but I really think there has to be uh, more uh, vision coming from local and regional authorities or national authorities where that's applicable. But to do that, I really think discussions such as today's have to move local, regional or national. I always feel here we are preaching to the choir, we know the problems, we know the, the part of the recipe, part of that secret sauce that uh, Paul was, was mentioning. We can learn from the great examples, but we do uh, need uh, a little bit of support uh, from the member states to make that a success and their vision. Um, I personally uh, have a soft spot for Italy. I've lived there uh, for, for a few years, uh, but I have to say uh, that uh, the goals and aims that Italians perhaps historically uh, are able to put before themselves um, and find sometimes the most interesting and also inspiring ways of attracting collaborations and cooperations um, it's, a, it's a very good example, um, and we can see that there will be some countries that will be interested to have certain uh, sing similar partnerships and others not, but it's about making them think what sort of a partnership or what sort of an idea might be beneficial to trigger those skills, to make this sort of ecosystem. Because once you have the campus, you have a whole ecosystem around it. Um, and you know, in one country, it will be a chips manufacturer. In another country, it will be a similar um, a campus. A third one has iMac like Belgium. So it's many different things uh, that could support the vital ecosystems, but we do need uh, the vision also of local uh, authorities. Um, not every uh, region has Professor Ventre, uh, but they have other, um, you know, excellent people that can drive those change. Um, and I would really want to see that, um, that engagement out there. And I'm very sorry I have to leave because I think there were excellent questions addressed to you, uh, and I would love to hear those answers. Uh, but um, I'm sure my team uh, that will um, uh, remain uh, will brief me afterwards. And sorry that I'll, I'll need to uh, excuse myself. Terrific. Thank you, Eva. Thanks for being with us. Let me just add, as you shake hands, you've done a tremendous job of Thanks setting the so stage much. for Thank where you. the conversation needs to begin next time. And I'm sure we'll be in new territory with this all soon. Uh, I, I think uh, there were still some questions from the audience. We are over time, though, however. Uh, Georgi, would you like to go first? And then um, Professor Vonsko will give you the final word here. Well, I, I think there was just a uh, reference to the interoperability issue, I just want to comment on something which, uh, well, Eva unfortunately left, but uh, I, because you, you spoke of the deja vu, and if you allow me, I just want to say something on that one. Um, I, I want to appreciate, you know, the role of um, uh, different policymakers in, in the EU over the years, but the reality is that the EU tries over and over and over again good ideas. At some point, they work. It's been always <laughs> like that. So I just want to, you know, we're not inventing the wheel here. In I fact, like I've that. always said that what we put forward is not a revolution, but that's not a good starter normally. Like that, yeah. So um, you see, it's about persistence. And at some point, if it's a good enough idea, if you work really hard, so it might work. But uh, whatever said about the local authorities, and this comes back to the member states, is really crucial. I think 
unless we work together with them, um, all of these good ideas, you know, will of course stay here within the, the, the choir. But on the interoperability issue that you've said, um, um, I think this is where, you know, the commission has also the kind of the guts to go into areas which perhaps are not necessarily understandable to many other people and to put forward titles uh, which are also a little bit more technical because the reality is that universities work together if the infrastructure is um, uh, compatible to each other. And unless that happens, you know, you can have uh, a lot of goodwill and good ideas, but uh, it wouldn't happen. So the interoperability point is a case in point one, because that's what we hear also from the universities, and you've been quite instrumental in setting up this discussion. So um, I hope that um, with the proposal, we can also establish something like a common uh, reference uh, where we can uh, support higher education in this also exchange of data and content because that's the basics. Um, and uh, it's very technical, as I said. So, uh, you know, I would stop uh, perhaps here. Thank you. Well, it's very technical, but it's very important. And I, I appreciate uh, the idea. Maybe we can demystify it through conversations like yeah. this because it, yeah. it is an important one to take forward. Giorgio, you've had quite a few questions uh, put on your plate here. And if you don't mind, I'm going to add one more uh, since you're. I believe the only professor in the room here today. Do we have other professors here? Um, uh, what will you take from this discussion and what would you like to leave us with for further reflection? Wow. <laughs> I told you it was gonna be hard work here. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm a professor. I mean, that's... <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, so, I mean, let me, uh, first of all, thank you very much for your question, your points, and, uh, okay, first question, the government involvement. Uh, okay, at the, just to give you an idea, at the, our future fair, we will be having a, the presence of our Ministry for the Public Administration. They will be, I mean, we invited them, they, we are writing a, a MOU with them, and they will be, um, coming to us, first of all, of course, to convince students to apply for a government job. That's a major point. And, uh, but still, I mean, also for, I mean, uh, uh, working with us to understand how we can work together. Uh, we, in, 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 the, in the video that I showed, there was uh, one of the hackathons that we regularly uh, run. One was called hack.gov and was exactly on this. And was, uh, I mean, the idea was to bring in innovation into public government by uh, concrete examples. And so we had the partnership with the, with the government and we had students working for today, not in day, really, on this idea. Uh, th this is something that we should do because the more we, we link uh, training with open innovation and also with startups, the better it is because in, in this, everything must, should be very practical. Otherwise, we'd be just re re repeating the way we teach inside university that it's good but it's not enough that's that's the that's the the, the trick and, and by the way in all the academy that we run we usually have our student work on project work at the end of the the period the, the learning period and most of them are done with public entities for example with the regional rail system in campania that we run project with them and so on even we develop apps for the regional government I mean, just to give you an idea on on, on that Quality assurance, uh, that, that's a good point. I mean, uh, I, am, I, I spend, let me say 30% of my, my job of as university professor to do Q, uh, quality assurance for my classes, my courses. And it is important. I, I, I find it very important to be sure that the, the, we, 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 the teaching we provide is high quality. Uh, on this side, though, I mean, on the uh, academy side, our ch choice was to be a little bit more informal because we wanted to be, to adapt ourselves in a faster way, to, to, to move on, on the need of Apple, and our needs, the needs of the company working with us, and to learn by what is going on. For example, I mean, the Vision Pro stuff we have been talking this morning, and uh, I mean, it is, I mean, it, it is a, a, an example of a new te technology that can have a huge impact. And I would be, uh, at least in Italy, it would be very difficult to work on, 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 uh, on having a formal approach to that by 
still, I mean, I do believe that uh, the quality is important, quality assurance is important. And we work closely with Apple and all the companies that work with us for um, um, hiring our talents to, 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 to ensure proper quality. And of course, this, is, um, this approach can work for app development. If I have been working on you know, uh, cyber security, that is a little bit more high tech, I would probably follow a different approach, more, more proper, more formal, I would say. And the, 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 what, uh, I'm gonna take a lot of information. I mean, that, that, uh, I thank you, Georgi, for, uh, and Eva for all the insights on also on the work of, um, both in the uh, EC structure inside the parliament. And uh, for example, I was, by reading this, 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 this commission uh, work, uh, I, I was very impressed by the idea of having a high level group to, to work, I, I, I believe this is going to be a very important piece of this construction because you, as Eva was saying, we need to start from the best practices, from the experience, but of course they can change. I mean, we, we, we were working with Apple, but it would be different to work with another company like, you know, a, a, a semiconductor company, they, they, you know, with different competences, different skills needed. So I guess the, this, uh, this high-level group can influence the way the, the local uh, and the national government can, can work. Because it's, uh, for example, we, in my region, we have a huge number of need uh, students that are not in training and not employed. And this is a major problem. And it's a paradox because in my region we have, you know, 20% excellence in research and the university, and then you get 30% of students that simply leave the schools. And we we cannot forget forget it. We we, we need we need to work on this, and this can be done only if you work on the, on the local level and you work with the national government on on the way we teach and the way we train teachers. Fundamental. It was a point very important and. The, and this is something that to me is missing currently in Italy. I mean, we, 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 the, it's not clear that we must invest in teaching on this. And this is what I'd be bringing with me. Thank you. And, and on that Thank note, you. we've run uh, well over time. And I appreciate that all of you have stayed with us here uh, towards uh, the very end. Um, I just maybe, um, in conclusion, add something I said, which is I was only half kidding about wanting to visit you in Naples. No, no, no. Um, but and the, the invitation is on, on the table right now. Exactly, and I hope everyone in the room can join. And while we're there, I would very much like also to meet the local government officials, because I understood from this conversation that they're an important part of this formula. And if there were some way to do it, we would love to meet with a group of NEETS. Um, and I have been to sessions like that. And what they say is often very important and very powerful, because the, the issues, you know, we're all passionate about it in our own way, uh, but they quite often sound and look a little bit different on the ground. Yeah. Um, so we would, this would be a study visit and not sheer pleasure, though I have a feeling a lot of pleasure would be had along, <laughs> along the way. Listen, you guys have been really terrific. Thanks so much for taking time. Oh, I have We'll be, winding to, we'll be winding down for the summer again soon, but the Lisbon Council will be very active on this dossier, and I know everyone on this panel too, because despite everything Eva said, there's possibility in the air now. So uh, let's, uh, let's take these new initiatives and put some, some lovely wine in these skins and make something happen. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.